Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for waking up early to listen to my talk. And thank you very much, uh, especially uh, to the people abroad, uh, some people from Ireland. I know it's very uh, even earlier there, so I appreciate that you uh, uh, woke up so early for this. Um, I would like to um, thank Christus uh, and his team for the excellent organization of the conference. Um, and to say to the speakers who couldn't make it that um, guys, you should really be sorry because we're having a fantastic time here in Cyprus. So next time, uh, next time we have to organize this a little bit better. Okay, we have tickets and everything. All right. So today, this morning, uh, well, yes. So the, yeah, the first thing I must say is that I don't have a PowerPoint because I was changing my topic until very late last, my, my uh, paper until very late, late last night. It was really long. So I didn't have time to make a PowerPoint, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try not to read as much as possible. Um, now, uh, before I start, uh, I would like to say that I'm not, um, uh, an, an expert on, on this. However, this topic, phenomenology and mindfulness, is very close to my heart because I'm studying phenomenology and I have a background in mindfulness as well. Um, have, I've been trained in mindfulness and sometimes I, not sometimes, very often, I find, I find it difficult to um, to make sense of these two together. So what I'm going to talk about here is basically my own struggle. Um, and what I would like from you is, is maybe to help me make sense of it or, or not, okay? Because we don't have to make sense of it. So I'm going to focus on Heidegger's earlier works. I, I know that uh, we had some excellent speakers um, that talked about Heidegger's later works and mindfulness. Now, today I'm going to talk about being in time, right? And mindfulness. Um, um, okay, so I think it's very important to talk about the topic on mindfulness these days because in the past uh, couple of decades, uh, mindfulness has, has hit the world by storm, right? And it has been integrated in pop culture, in the workplace, in the fitness industry, in the classroom. It's even part of our everyday vocabulary. So I think we should start talking about it in philosophy and in phenomenology as well. Um, and mindfulness is also accessible and um, widely accessible, right? Through free mobile applications and free courses, self-help guides, right? Social media, YouTube. Um, it owns its popularity partly to being promoted as a strategy to reduce stress, increase productivity, and ease symptoms of anxiety and depression. And this is what I'm going to talk about, emotions today. Um, for this reason, uh, mindfulness has been vastly integrated in psychotherapeutic programs, some of which use it as their main therapeutic st strategy. For instance, the, the mindful-based intervention, interventions, the, the most famous one is by Kabat-Zinn, right? The mindful-based stress reduction uh, course, right? And, um, well, Mindfulness uh, has become, it, it's also very common uh, among educational institutions and big corporate, corporates to offer free mindfulness sessions to their students or to their employees to reduce stress and increase their productivity. Um, this is something um, that was mentioned yesterday as well by Dr. Lisa Foran, and I'm going to return uh, to that point at the end of the um, so in the past years, uh, there has been an effort to find 
links, similarities between mindfulness and the phenomenology tradition. And indeed, there seem to be some common theme, themes that can stimulate fascinating discussions, such as the ones we had in the past days in the conference. Um, uh, mindfulness is often presented to be a secular science-based strategy. Uh, however, we should remember that it's not independent of the metaphysical, ethical, and sociological commitments of Buddhism, okay, as, as, as openly admitted by many practitioners, okay, and First of all, I would like to say that I agree with those scholars who claim that we should not separate the theoretical implications of the mindfulness movement in the West from the Eastern Buddhist uh, origins of it, despite the fact that diverse understandings of mindfulness can be found not only among the several Buddhist traditions, but also among those involved with its clinical employment. Um, in my own paper, I want to focus on a common theme appearing in mindfulness practice and Heidegger's being in time. That is the process of connect, connecting with the self, a process of liberation from living in an autopilot mode. In particular, I want to highlight the striking difference between the two accounts regarding the emotions involved in this uh, process. Um, now, let's start a little bit talking about what do we mean by mindfulness. Um, so I was planning to have a PowerPoint uh, a slide there, but anyway, forget about it. Um, so mindfulness is a strategy to keep us grounded, to use it, the, the term that, kind of, uh, that is fastly used in the bibliography uh, and in the practice in the present moment. Uh, we can debate a lot about what mindfulness means to different schools and clinical interventions, but I think we can mostly agree that the basic pattern of all mindfulness practices is to cultivate the ability to return the attention to what is happening right now. Okay? That often includes body awareness strategies. Now, we, we um, in, in the conference already, um, we, we saw some very interesting uh, links with neural computer phenomenology about that. Um, so yes, one of the most typical strategies that primarily support the establishment and continuity of the state of mindfulness is cultivating body awareness. The felt physical presence of the body is often used as an anchor of awareness of the present moment. Whereas during normal daily life, this felt sense of physical presence is usually not noticed. Mindfulness of the body results in a sense of being firmly grounded in the body. That's why one of the introductory exercises in many mindfulness programs is to start noticing the body in all, in all possible kinds of everyday situations. For instance, brushing your teeth, right? Walking wearing your clothes, and I, I know Clive first talk about walking, wearing your clothes. So awareness of the physical presence provides an easily available sense of here, and mindfulness itself, itself aims to keep us in the now, right? Um, mindfulness promise, promises to serve as a powerful tool that will help liberate from painful feelings and emotions, even feelings associated with disease and death. Um, here and here, we can easily see why the body awareness is so important in all mindfulness practices, right? Why? Because when becoming aware of the body, it becomes easier to return to the body, even during the most emotionally challenging situations. Um, just to a quote here from a um, Buddhist uh, scholar, who writes about how to practice mindfulness, he says, the body is always there. Wherefore, turning mindfulness towards it can serve almost like a portable meditation device, ready at hand in any situation. All it takes is to become aware of your breathing pattern or some part of the body, and from that entry door to allow mindfulness to encompass the whole body, enabling the mind to rest in that 
and cope and cope and focusing um, awareness as its reference point. Um, and I know there were some talks about breathing as well, um, which is great. Now, uh, mindfulness or awareness, uh, these are two terms that, uh, that they are not identical, but they are often used interchangeably in the bibliography. It can be rather described as a mental quality that has to be learned and cultivated through everyday practice. Why? Because the mind is seen as having an inherent tendency to getting caught in some sort of fantasy when in, in search of something that is not present. At least this is the, the main uh, dogma okay, of um, mindfulness theory. So mindfulness is lost when we are distracted, when we are daydreaming. So Jim, yesterday when you, you had your talk, I asked you, what, what, what is happening? Is daydreaming mindful? mindful? Because, because during, uh, uh, during a lot of uh, guided meditations, kind of the, the instruction is, when you, if you catch yourself daydreaming, return back to what is happening right now. So daydreaming is the forbidden place. Right, uh, even though what you said ma makes sense, right? And, and we'll talk about it. So, so mindfulness is lost when we are distracted, when we are daydreaming, at least that's kind of the main uh, dogma, when we imagine something that will take place in the future, or when we think about memories of the past. Now, uh, I, I'm going to say something now that I, that I know I understand it's debatable uh, in the bibliography, and I believe there might be a, a, at least one presenter later talking about consciousness. So, so they might they might want to say more about that. So, I, I'm going to say very briefly uh, and without again being um, too sure whether it's it's right or not, but. Um, the way I, I understand mindfulness and consciousness is the following, okay? That we should not understand them as being one thing, okay? So since, so, so in other words, mindfulness should not be confused with consciousness. So wh since whether we are mindful uh, of a meditation object or caught up in a dream or fantasy, the flow of consciousness is always there. What marks the difference between mindfulness and consciousness is that the second is a continuously present process of knowing, whereas the first is a quality which is not present in any type of experience. We have to, to cultivate it, okay? We have to educate ourselves in it. Now, so, that, so a key element of mindfulness theory and practice, um, which we can find in highly experienced well, is that during normal everyday life, we are often going into a pilot mode, which is the opposite to experience life. Mind. Now, here's the interesting part. Um, Heidegger and mindfulness practitioners would describe this everyday mode, living your life very differently. Um, so for mindfulness theory, everyday life is mostly overwhelming stressful it's a place of worry anxiety pain and suffering okay and this comes straight from the buddhist uh, uh, origins of mindfulness because according to the buddhist tradition worldly life is conceived as full of misery pain and suffering uh, for buddhist uh, living is 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 an awful life is is very bad it can be off right why? The main reason is, uh, the is because the phenomenal world is impermanent. So um, measuring time in units, um, our conceptualization of change can be, useful, can be useful. However, change is outside our control. Uh, what do we mean? We mean that bodies growing old, we lose beloved ones, we fall sick, we get disappointed, we experience physical pain. So. Well, of course, life is not just bitter things. However, even positive situations will eventually cause some suffering because of worldly life uh, is experienced as a manifestation of change. 
for this reason, mindfulness, um, my, my, uh, a key motto in mindfulness practice is never cling to anything or keep calmly knowing that change. Okay? Um, now, the main task of mindfulness is the recognition that whatever is experienced is a manifestation of change. In other words, the idea is that simply becoming aware of change of the process character of all experience are the undermines our unconscious attempt to control change and it frees us from taking time too seriously. This makes us less vulnerable to time-related stress, and, and that's how we, and that's why that's how we see kind of the, the clinical application of mindfulness. We are less vulnerable or if you like, we cultivate uh, resilience, is another very popular term, to disappointment, to grief, to worry. We see how crucial a role the awareness of the body plays in the process, of course, right? This sense of impermanence is felt in the body. Uh, we don't feel the same every day, okay? And I think we can see that uh, very clearly uh, in people who, who have a very good awareness of their own body, kind of yogis, kind of dancers, all right? You ask them, how are you today? And they immediately get, and get into kind of describing how their body feels, all right? It's, it's fascinating to, to hear them talking about, about their body and how their feelings are directly associated, felt in their body. Um, now, after body awareness is established, then mindfulness should be cultivated on the level feeling and emotion, okay? Every feeling is a, mess a messenger of impermanence. Feelings are ephemeral. Uh, and mindfulness practice encourages us to not identify with them, positive or negative, but is instead to take a step back and become aware that there is a feeling. Now you can ask me, what, what, what do we mean that become aware that there is a feeling? And, and there's a whole, that's a whole different story, okay? What do we really mean by that? Um, some practitioners would encourage you to observe where the feeling is located in your body. So where do you feel sadness? Where do you feel anger? And this kind of thing. Now, feeling impermanence makes it clear that neither pleasure nor pain last forever. And that's why mindfulness can be so comforting, right? So soothing when in a moment of crisis, okay? Why? Because there is no point to cling to feelings that are so ephemeral and constantly changing. If we simply leave them as they are, right, without getting involved with them, they will gradually lose their power to carry the mind away from the present moment, at least in theory. Right? Eventually, they can just come to be part of a comprehensive experience of impermanence, okay? Uh, which is at the very heart of Eastern spiritual and philosophical traditions. As long as we stay rooted in awareness of the whole body and attuned to it, to this directly felt sense of change, the tendency to react to feelings is undermined and progressively weakened. Intense feelings feed cravings, um, and cravings are always the source of, suff of suffering. Remember Schopenhauer, who was very influenced by, by Eastern philosophy. He was talking about the will, right? That can never be satisfied. And an individual should then learn to notice unpleasant and pleasant emotions and feelings when they arise in order to be able to recognize and halt habitual reactions before they have acquired in full force. Turning the light of awareness on feelings one trains to cause reactivity with mindfulness and learns to recite in stillness before being carried away by habitual, emotionally charged reactions. Hence, what has an awakening power from the autopilot mode, uh, including emotional autopilot mode, is stillness, okay? non-reactivity and staying present in the present uh, moment. Just to say here very quickly, in the earliest Buddhist tradition, clearly knowing has its foundation in the presence of mindfulness. 
it is only aware uh, it is only when we are aware of what we are doing that we can do it clear clearly um for uh, and, and another quote from the buddhist tradition is that the mind is like water when it is turbulent it is difficult to see when it's calm everything becomes clear and so we understand that from the mindfulness tradition which as you uh, see, I don't separate from its Buddhist uh, origins. The extreme emotions are exclusively present in the unexamined everyday life. Seeking happiness through bodily sense pleasures uh, will keep us in continued bondage, but seeking happiness through establishing a condition of the mind that is not attached to any worldly feelings, either pleasant or unpleasant, would lead us onwards exploration. According to this discourse, a certain hierarchy of feelings ought to be cultivated. Were the neutral or subtly pleasant hedonic tone experienced with the cultivated of insight stands out as the supreme one. The joy of liberation is the supreme type of unworldly pleasant feeling, and it is associated with a sense of tranquility concentration and balance. When one manages to cultivate awareness in the present moment, they can free themselves from these worldly feelings, establishing a constant mode of subtle joy, even during the most challenging or intense moments. Uh, I'm gonna say that very briefly because I'm realizing I'm running out of time. That's, and I, I'm not even in the half, the half point. Uh, that's because in the Buddhist tradition, in the um, it is the unexamined attitudes, the repetitive behavior patterns, and the ingrained habitual responses that create the sense of self. One should cultivate resistance to activity in relation to feelings before they have the chance to develop into moods or harden into attitudes. In other words, the self, the self is nothing other, but our tendency to react habitually to whatever happens to us was according to Buddhism. Freedom in Buddhism is essentially freedom from self. A life without reactive habit formation is a life free of self. Hence, the practice of mindfulness has a transformative, liberated power because it liberates us from the suffering of being stuck in the void notion of the self, which, uh, which identifies the unreflected life. Now, uh, I'm gonna move on to Heidegger and, and I'm gonna, very briefly. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm gonna talk uh, about his earlier concept of the everydayness of being in the world and the marginal emotions of anxiety and fear in order to highlight some key key differences with how he understands the authentic mode of resolution. Uh, okay, so in the period of being in time, Heidegger describes his own philosophical enterprise as a hermeneutics of authenticity, which has practical life as its thematic matter. At this period of his career, he argues that the main task of philosophy is to interpret human life in its being character. The being of, of factual life is a how rather than a what. It is the way life temporalizes itself. Practical life is the object of philosophy, and philosophizing is, is itself form of practical life. Practical life, which is the ground, the and condition of possibility for <laughs> philosophy, is also its obstacle, given life's tendency to fall away from itself and hide from itself for hiding. To attain this genuine situation of understanding, therefore, demands a turning around of life's falling tendency, and this can only come about through a resolute decision. However, Heidegger is quite explicit. One cannot get access to such a genuine situation of understanding within the everyday attitude. Authentic understanding needs a special attitude, one that opposes the average. Uh, everydayness and offers a clear break from its indifference and forgetfulness. Heidegger claims that the task of philosophy 
is radical questioning. And it is the degree of radicality of the questioning that marks the effectiveness of philosophical research. As radical questioning, philosophy stands in a certain opposition to the falling tendency of practical life, which tends to um, here, um, okay, so something that was deleted here, um, so right. Um, Okay, that's fine. I'm gonna I'm some, a big part just delete it. That's fine. Um, yes. So the question of access to an authentic understanding depends on finding the adequate uh, force structures and projections to get the right perspective. Okay. So as we saw in in all the previous talks, uh, in order to create links between a mindfulness and phenomenology we have to um, find um, the conditions required for one to shift their perspective, okay? Which involves a certain form of detachment from the everyday way of living one's life, to be able to think, to see things anew. Um, this is the main characteristic of both meditation practice and the authentic mode of resolute, uh, resoluteness perspective. They're both described as the moment when one, perceiving and accepting things as they are in the present moment, reconnects with their true self and realizes the potential. Um, obviously, we cannot get access to practical life by assuming a third person. Now, I believe that comparing mindfulness um, practice with Heidegger's early work is, is fascinating because in both accounts, the daily experience of life is commonly described as functioning on autopilot, daydreaming, as one being numb, asleep, or unconscious. And but the moment of breaking free from it is described radically differently. For Heidegger, the moment of detachment from the everyday inauthentic and ir irresolute way of existing, which he called the, the moment of vision, right, is always linked to anxiety in the face of grasping the full complexity and depth of one's finitude. It is seen as an almost violent, violent event that shakes you to the ground, an event which forces design to confront its own most pot potentiality for self -hood. This is in straight contrast to how mindfulness practitioners describe the interruption from the everyday dealings with the things in our environment they absorbed. Mindfulness practitioners suggest that this phenomenological shift happens through residing in stillness and when shifting our attention to timeless presence, right? The, the moment is associated with peacefulness and calmness in a position, the preoccupation by our daily encountering with the world, which is seen as an always stressful and overwhelming experience. Okay, I, I know I'm... I'm, I'm Finish now. You about five minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, so for Heidegger, authentic time is finitude, in authentic time is infinite. To describe time in any other way um, as based in something other than the self is authentic. We cannot escape time or take time as an illusion. To have a future means to expect, to, to anticipate, look forward to. If it is possible to be toward anything at all, it's because there is a future. The future is meaningful to me because uh, it is one of the ways in which I exist. The future as a way of existing turns out to be the ultimate presupposition of authentic existence. Okay? So we see immediately the tension there, right? Mindfulness is rooted in the present moment, how it talks about the future. The, the, the varied and uh, multifarious forms of awareness and consciousness um, all presuppose to some extent or another um, the basic attitudes of being toward future and from the past. Okay, I'm gonna skip a few things here. Um, yes, so again, it's not the present that bears the of existence, but the future. And Heidegger obviously gives priority to possibility Second in importance to the future is the past. 
and the present is actually the least significant of the three axes. Um, and authentic temporality means that design actually temporalizes itself in the way the future, the having been, are united in the present. Um, okay, I'm skipping a few bits here, and I'm going to say that the awareness of our existence requires violence done to the everyday perspective of existence. Lostness in the day is being revealed. Okay, but this by, uh, this by no means suggests any kind of abandonment or rejection of the everyday perspective. The everyday perspective is never abandoned, okay, it's descended. The necessary turning around of the falling tendency in the everyday attitude has to be found within, back to life itself, okay. Um, of course, <clears throat> Even though uh, we must take uh, our starting point of our everyday of our of understanding being is everydayness. However, at the same time, this is a form of misunderstanding. We're told by Heidegger um, because it does not grasp design in its authenticity and totality. Um, in, in order to gain access to the authentic situation of understanding, to get into the right way of seeing, he would say um, that would demand passion as a counterweight to the indifference of the everyday act. Okay? All right, so I'm just skipping some parts and, and, and I'm, I, I want to kind of um, close up this uh, paper. Um, so, so I claim that in, in both accounts, uh, we see, we see some, some common themes arising, right? Um, that kind of both accounts describe that in daily life, we get caught up in different pragmatic projects or rushing through activities, um, always attending something to happen, right? Um, however, breaking, from this pattern is being described very differently. Now, so so my own question, and, and I haven't, I haven't, I, I'm not sure about the answer yet. Maybe we can we can talk about it after during the discussion is whether the practice of mindfulness can help us to lead an authentic life. Can whether mindfulness can uh, really help us become an authentic self or no self. Um, so, and so, and the fact that his has been so vastly employed by big corporates, okay, to enhance productivity and ease stress, it might be a strong indicator that no, right, it might not. Um, there is also, there is also, for, for the people who are kind of involved in, 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 in this field, I think they would easily, uh, uh, all, also admit that there is some, some sort of pretentiousness in, 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 in it, what it means to be more, okay? And in also what the meditation practice encompasses. And, and another thing is that there is a, a lot of guilt for not being mindful enough, right? So th these things are also need to be explored. And um, yes, so so I know, I know I'm, I'm out of time and I'm sorry, I, I rushed through the second section of the paper. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for your time and, and your attention. And I look forward to your comments and feedback.
Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, okay. So we now uh, have uh, Angelo Sofocleus from the University of York. Angelo, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Christo. Thank you to this team for organizing this conference. And uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to speak in Cyprus about my research. Um, we're not that many because you know, we're not to have half of us are in this room. So it's really a pleasure to be able to present my research here. So my topic today is about depression and mindfulness. Uh, my PhD research is on depression, and we are going to be talking about that and about how certain experiences of depressed people and how mindfulness can help depressed people in treatment, in holding a different attitude to life. So what we see in experience of depression, a very core aspect of the experience is that people feel that the future is empty, that they, they have no opportunity to the future, that the future does not hold the possibility of change. And there is also a lack of hopelessness. Uh, so there is hopelessness. That, so that means that the future does not hold the opportunity for, uh, for hope, for change, for the individual to actualize their objectives, their aims, and there is also a lack of belongingness in the world. So what we see in depression is the individual not feeling connected, not feeling that they belong in the world. But mindfulness can help with that, can help, first of all, the individual acquire a sense of belonging in the world, a sense of connectedness to the world, which also involves connectedness to other people. And they, uh, it can also help them acquire uh, a sense of of the future as something which is open, a sense of the future as something which is can hold uh, many possibilities. So let me start with someone who is not really a um, phenomenologist. Uh, a few months ago, I was looking at some Cypriot folklore poets, and I came across the poetry of uh, Pablo uh, Yassidi, who is not very known. Uh, he was a uh, Shepherd, he only went to school until the age of 11, but he published a lot, uh, 14 books in total. And when reading his poetry, I came upon the, the following uh, poet, which I'll show you in a second, which demonstrates the whole phenomenological understanding of time. It's very unlikely that he was ever exposed to phenomenology, but he wrote the following. In translation, I have a very old body, by the mind of the new world. Even if you're born in 3000, you're still a man of my time. So perhaps this demonstrates how fundamental phenomenology is to the human psyche. Someone who didn't have any training in phenomenology, he was in the fields, was a shepherd, and no formal education, uh, very little formal education. Yet he describes in the very uh, sentence this a Cartesian reject, uh, a rejection of the Cartesian understanding of, of the world and the unity between the, the body and the mind, the body which wears out, it, uh, it's affected by time, but with the mind that can adjust, adapt to the world. And more importantly, the second verse, the second line, even if you're born 3000, the year 3000, you're still a man of my time. So we see this unity between people who have nothing, uh, were born in very, very different periods. And in this reflects and expresses the phenomenological understanding of time, this unity between past, present, and future. Now, in what we see as the, this would perhaps, uh, uh, demonstrate or express our understanding of time, the past, uh, the past, present, and future. But we must start by realizing that this is perhaps to a big extent a cultural 
thing. Um, other cultures, would, their understanding of, some, of time would be nothing like that. Other cultures would see time as uh, cyclical, or circular. We might imagine ourselves as being the person and moving in time. Other cultures would see the person as static and time moving uh, to reach them, where us, we're thinking of, us, of ourselves as moving toward the future. Uh, other cultures would see time as being uh, past, the past as being in front of them, whereas the uh, perception of the past as behind us and the future as in front of us. But in other cultures, the past is in front, so they will say yesterday and tomorrow, because we can see the we know what the past is, so it must be in front of us. Well, what's behind us is what we don't know, uh, that's the future. So there's many different ways that we can understand even the, the cultural conception of time. So phenomenologically, instead of having this linear understanding of past, present, and future, we have a more uh, something that they exist in that at the same time, we could say something that presents some kind of unity between past, present, and future. And there is a sense of co-dependency, co-determinancy of the past, present, and future. They all exist at the, the same time, if we want to put it that way, co-determining the other, uh, one another. And it's it's an understanding of time that shows how the past can influence the present, but also how the, the present is influenced by, by the future. So it's when we, the, the problem that uh, the phenomenology of, of time seeks to solve is how can the present involve an understanding of something that has passed and how can it conceptualize something that has not yet come. In other words, we have two things. We have the successive flow of consciousness, there's a flow in our everyday life of consciousness, and at the, uh, on the other hand, there is the, success of the, success, the succession of the temporal object. So successive flow of consciousness and the succession of the temporal object. But we can keep uh, on track with what we see in the world, our consciousness is on track with, with uh, worldly objects. And the, uh, the question is, how can this be done? How can we be in the present with the objects we perceive? So imagine listening to, uh, to music. Any of that notes is not something on its own. It's influenced by the, the previous notes, and there is this kind of expectation of what is going to follow. So when listening to music, it's not that we listen to each note in as a distinct kind of piece of music or sound, but there is some unity in, in each of those notes, which is influenced by the previous notes, the ones that are followed, and we anticipate what is going to follow. We don't listen to jazz and expect that two seconds we will listen to rock music and then to opera. Now there's some, some kind of unity, some kind of flow to, to music. And this follows everyday experience as well. So Husserl thought that in this sense, consciousness must grasp more than the punctual now. We are conscious of the now, but that's not the whole story. It must be conscious of what has just been and what is just about to be. We're always conscious of not just the now, but what follows and what is going to follow. The question Husserl sought to ask is, how is it possible for a subject to be aware uh, of something which is no longer present, I, whether we refer to the past or to the future? And in order to develop that understanding, he worked on these three terms, retention, primal impression, and pretension. In other words, the past, present, and 
future. Let's look at each of those in turn. So the primal impression is the now phase of consciousness, the present. Very simple terms. Retention refers to the retainment in consciousness of the just elapsed phase of experience, the just past, what happened a few seconds ago. And for attention is the anticipation that something is about to be experienced. And they all come together in each now phase. Uh, and the past tells something about the present, and the, our anticipation of the future also tells something about the present. The fact that I, that I was standing here 10 seconds ago, still giving, giving this talk, and I wasn't speaking in German or Spanish or running around the room, tells something about the now. And your expectation, your anticipation of what I am going to do in 10 seconds also shapes our understanding of now. We can see that in other cases as well. When we see the tra trajectory of a ball, we can see the, the ball at the present being there. But what we see is also influenced by uh, past traje trajectory and its anticipated trajectory. If the ball is coming towards us, we might uh, will, will act differently. The ball does not just appear out of nowhere but it follows a trajectory which is, has been influenced by the past, determined by the past in a way, and there is anticipation of what is going to happen. And again, in music, there is unity in, in music. There is unity in what we experience in a song, what we anticipate to experience in a song. Now, something important to say is that when we speak about <coughs> retention particularly we're not speaking about memory we're not just speaking about how we don't have a memory of what happened 10 seconds ago but the past comes and unites it merges with the present so they are again codependent in a way and this is how to serve for it and we'll look at it for these for a bit the Husserl said, the immanent thing could not be given in its unity at all if the perceptual consciousness is not also encompassed, along with the point of actually present sensation, the continuity of fading faces that pertain to the sensation belonging to earlier nows. The past would be nothing for the consciousness belonging to the now if it were not represented in the now. So let's look at some keywords here to understand this. First of all, Husserl speaks about unity. The immanent thing could not be given in its unity. So we're not just speaking about the now, but the unity between past, present, and future. There is, of course, acceptance of the actually present sensation, what we are currently sensing, what we are currently experiencing, but we must understand that also as a continuity, that it came from the past, it's not at the present, and will probably continue to the future. And also, there is an understanding that any past moment and every future moment, we can not say that with absolute certainty, but every future moment will be a now. So there is an earlier now and a future now, uh, a present now, which is the final impression. So again, we see this unity in uh, in Husser, this unity that seeks to answer the question, how is it possible for a present moment to have in, co in consciousness the past and an antici anticipation of the future? Now, short word of, of caution there. I'm not sure what the German original says, but this translation has Husserl speaking about the past being represented in the now. Uh, I don't think. And I'm not sure what the original says, but wouldn't be fair perhaps to say that the sort of advocated for any kind of the past being represented in the future in the sense that it's reflected in the future or any kind of representationalist, but more like the past being retained in the future. That's why the, the word that's used is retention, that the past is retained 
in the future, uh, but rather than merely represented, sorry, retained in the now rather than be represented in the now. And to serve uh, for this a hundred years ago, but we can see this in modern um, time as well, that there is in, in, in how we experience the present, there is an understanding that we also have in, information about the past. What we now experience, um, our brain can take what has happened very recently and take all of this into one experience in the present and also in regard to the future as well. That uh, kind of uh, the famous uh, predictive coding that there is so, so much that might happen in the future. And there is so much that has happened in the past that it wouldn't be useful for our brain to just take everything into consideration. Uh, but it selects what has happened and what might happen in the future based on experience, based on expectations, and then make a model of what uh, might happen. And just a Another word by Gallagher, I think he put it very well. Primary impression, retention, and pretension are not elements that simply add themselves to each other. They are rather a genetic relation. They have a self-constituting effect on each other. So it's, it's, it's an idea against a very simplistic understanding of time that sees the past as something that has happened, that we must just leave where it is. Um, and the future as something that will happen that does not affect us yet. But it's an idea that what Gallagher expresses this kind of idea that we see these unities between past, present, and future. Now, what's important to say about these three terms that Husserl views is not uh, just that it's something that we just uh, observe or experience in the world, but we experience this personally, that as something that has happened or is happening to us. So when we experience, when we have an experience, there's also the subjective, the personal aspect of that. And that's where some subjective experience of depression might come in in a bit later. So going back to our, how we might understand the, the future and the past, in briefly, we can understand the past uh, or our understanding of time, a cultural understanding of time sees the past as something static, something fixed, something without the possibility of change. The past is there, it has happened, it cannot change. But uh, the future is something that's open, contingent, is full of possibilities. The future is yet open, it's yet to happen. So it's open for us with loads of possibilities to change it as we wish to a good extent. Especially in regard to the future, which I will focus on, there is an understanding, there is the conception that future nows can be different present. Now, so when we think about the future, we make plans, we make, we have aims, we have objectives. So we have an understanding of the future as something that can be changed, something that can be different to the present now. Now, how this manifests uh, in experiences of depression is a feeling that the past is not open to change. The past is not level it's not available for us to have any objectives any aims it's not an open future that can be adjusted to us or that we can affect in in a way but it's a blocked future which does not offer the possibility of meaningful change so while in ordinary in an ordinary sense we would see the future as open and as involving the possibility of meaningful change. In depression, we see the opposite. We see the future as blocked and as devoid of any 
kind of meaningful change. So the present in this sense is experienced as meaningless and the past also as negative. The past would just determine the present. In this way, the, the past is turned into, into the what we might call the dominant temporal domain. Whereas ordinarily the present is the dominant temporal domain, in depression the past becomes dominant both to both the present and the future. The past, what has happened to us in the past, has determined both our present moment and the future. So the future, in, instead of involving anticipation, continuity, contingency, a sense of how things can be different, there is, uh, it's blocked, there is no opportunities for change. These individuals expressing that they cannot see ever see themselves getting better. And there is also a sense of time collapsing in depression. So there is no, the sense of time is lost. So in general terms, there is no anticipation for the future. This fact about the present, which is involves anticipation, is absent from experience of depression. Let's look at the few quotes. Um, taking this from Brampton, their autobiography, she says, what time is it? A little after 10, uh, 10 in the morning. I try to remember what 10 in the morning means, how it feels, but I cannot. Time means nothing to me anymore. We know the given time scale within which bones heal. We know why and we know how. Nobody knows how depression goes. We don't know why and we don't know how. So there is this timelessness of depression that exists everywhere and nowhere at the same time. There is the, there is no ordinary conception or understanding of time. Time collapses. We also see that in another individual from the mind charity, there is no time of the year when I guarantee I'm going to be fine and well. You go to the doctor, they tell you you're going to heal from your physical disease in three months, two years, five years, never. But in depression, Nobody knows, might be a month, might be forever. So this is what we speak when we uh, talk about the timelessness of depression. And uh, even some other quotes that uh, from a study by Radcliffe and colleagues. Someone said, I just felt very detached from time, simply didn't matter. There's also this detachment on time that's expressed in other quotations as well. When I'm depressed, I don't seem to notice time. It just doesn't matter to me. It all seems to blend into a mass of nothing. So this aspect, these aspects of time, time and impression, retention, pretension that are so fundamental to our everyday being are simply vanished, are simply disappear in depression. So the individual cannot anticipate anything for the future, at the present, time means nothing to them, and maybe they're just influenced by the past in negative ways. We see that in that it affects their interpersonal relationship as well. <coughs> Someone quoting yeah. from the Radcliffe study. Depression is the worst feeling in the world. And when you're absorbed in its depths, you just don't even want to be there. Anything to stop the numbness and pain. You can't see far into the future. So you can't see aspirations or dreams. Everything I ever wanted to do with my life before seems impossible now. So if we had established that there is this unity between past, present, and future, and particularly focusing now on the, on the present and the future, that they are caught dependent, we see someone saying that they cannot anticipate anything in the future, that they cannot hope for anything, that there is no way in which their life can be different in the future. So this, of course, affects the now, the present moment. 
again, even more quotations, when depressed, I see life as pointless and sometimes cruel. I cannot see any possibilities for change or improvement. Again, no possibilities for change or improvement. There is no anticipation for any kind of change. Whereas this is the case in ordinary, in our ordinary experience of the world. We anticipate different ways in which Today we might do uh, lots of different things, or on the weekend, or in our lives, our short-term and long-term goals. This defines who we are at the present moment, but this seems to disappear in case of depression. And it can also, in major depression cases, severe depression cases, this can extend from the individual to the whole humanity. I can't see any future for myself or the rest of the human race. So we can understand this and analyze this in terms of possibilities. Thank you. So we can understand this in terms of possibilities. What is possible for us in the future? And we might think that if we all have an ordinary understanding of time, possibilities are kind of the same for uh, everyone. But what we see in depression is that there is a difference between what's possible for me, the depressed individual, and what's possible for others. So there is this distinction that what's not possible to the individual is possible to others and up the other way around. This is how Strauss put it. In depression, the ego time of the movement of life gets stuck, whereas the world time goes on and passes by. So there is a, a world time in which the, the world goes by, but then there is my time, the ego time, which is slower. I'm stuck in the present. I do not flow with you at the same pace. Like we're in traffic and everyone goes at their pace faster, but somehow I cannot get on their speed. And then from the practical study, we see someone saying, sometimes I feel like the world has departed from me. And I look at people on streets or cars passing by like they were scenes from a movie. So we see this experience of depression of the individual standing there and just observing the world passing by, going by without feeling the opportunity engage or participate in the world, which is what we see in Fuchs has termed this as an intersubjective desynchronization. We're not synchronized with others anymore. We experience the world in, the, in a different pace, and we cannot just keep up with other people. So it has a, an intersubjective. Um, element as well, which is disturbed in experiences of depression. Otherwise, time would flow ordinarily. In depression, we see people seeing time flows slower. They're stuck in the present. So this kind of detaches them from the rest of the world, who seems the individual to just be going on with their lives as normal. So. There is a sense of the future as lacking openness, and most importantly, of the past and the future being indistinguishable anymore. With the past, it's closed, fixed, there's no possibility of change. But that's how exactly how the future is experienced as well. Static, fixed, no possibility for change. So this puts the individual into a state of incarceration, isolation, alienation words that we see very often in experiences of depression. And there is a sense that things are not or cannot change, that the individual cannot feel happiness, they feel that they cannot belong in the world, which is where mindfulness might be able to come in. Just looking at the few studies, um, mindfulness can lead to increased positive effect and increased anxiety and negative effect. 
which are things that might help us to connect to the world. There is an increased awareness, a present moment awareness and um, happiness and the decrease of that of anxiety. There's also a uh, no rumination, so not allowing the past to affect the present that much and less distress, less depression, less anxiety. And also, we see that in the personal uh, relationships as well, that mindfulness can help individuals connect to their partner, show more uh, empathy to other people, which can connect individuals to others and also establish a sense of belongingness in the world and a more living in the present. Uh, rather than being affected by the past or just looking at the closed or hopeless future. And just uh, on my uh, last uh, slides, finishing in a uh, very short time, we understand that as uh, mindfulness as key to predicting relationship satisfaction and it's associated with expressing ourselves better. Um, a short word of uh, twist here. Um, we might see mindfulness as something which, uh, as some studies have shown, that helps us de decrease anxiety, decrease stress, decrease melancholia. Whereas phenomenology might say that, well, we don't, we do not need to decrease those. They are there for a reason. And we must work through those through anxiety to feel our uh, presence in the world, to have belongingness in the world. So let's take that with cautiously. The, the goal is to work through and uh, through um, the so called negative emotions to achieve belongingness in the world and not to, to get them to the side. So, closing, it's uh, something that can help us be in the present, that there is this unity between um, past, present, and the future, which can be reestablished in uh, following mindfulness training. And it can be, yeah, can help us reclaim as, as a new title, our sense of belongingness in the world. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so uh, question time, Jim. Thank you both of you. Very, very thematically close presentations. Um, let me see if I got you right. Both of you. Uh, you seem to be developing here a kind of implicit critique of uh, the, the standard uh, habit zen approach to mindfulness. You seem to be saying that as phenomenologists, we have something a little more to add to this. That's what I'm taking from your presentation, that the naive emphasis on the present can be naive, can be uh, a little mindless. <clears throat> and with the existential phenomenological approach that Heidegger offers us, with the emphasis on our own most future possibilities, that there's something to add here that may be missing in the Buddhist account. Do I have you right so far? Right. Yeah. Great. Very interesting what you say. In fact, it could almost be the definition of depression to be lost in, in a circular present. You know? uh, very interesting. And, and that existential, I loved how you concluded there, that with the existential phenomenological approach that Heidegger gives us, you go into the depression to get out of it. You don't suppress it by taking your mind off and going into the present moment. Instead, you, you, you encounter it with courage. And, and you do what Freud called Durkar bike, you work it through. And then that really opens an authentic future possibility. And you become more you. Yeah. Yeah.
So I have your right there. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's right. the understanding that when we see illness more generally, um, and Orlo Merleau-Ponty, he called illness a complete form of existence. Mm -hmm. He uh, said it's a new signification of behavior. It's something, and we should not understand illness merely in terms of subtraction from mm -hmm. ordinary, from health. Because what we do is take a standard way of being in the world as the, the healthy way of being in the world, yeah. and then we subtract mm -hmm. elements from that to reach illness. So illness is like what's missing from the ordinary yeah. account of life, but that's not what it is. It's illness is a complete form of existence. And now comes to mind something from Harvey Carell that we listen to on on say in one of your papers she describes a her experience with some kind of uh, serious illness. Mm -hmm. And she says that um, what uh, remember what has what was a foreign invasion of a peaceful life has now come, become that life. Illness was my new way of being. Mm -hmm. So illness gets to define one's being in the world. It's not, can't do that at least. It's not always something foreign, but something that can express uh, what one's being is, or I find the mental problem way. It's a complete form of existence. Yeah, illness is just something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just to uh, add, just to say that that your conclusion actually, it, it was uh, it was perfect as a conclusion to my paper, even though it, it, it meant I, I was running out of time and I was being very sloppy at the end. But what you said, it was actually what I, I wanted to say ideally. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Jim put it exactly very nicely. Yeah. No, that's very thoughtful. The author of the room is that uh, there is a there is a really good critique. It's not to deny its importance and its practice and its value, but it, it, it needs to spell out some issues. And also the existential phenomenal approach to such pathology has a lot to say for it. But uh, not much to offer. And there is a way we can practice meditation, but with a being informed in an existential chronological way. We add to this discussion. It's really good. Depression's a great example of that. Can be, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe just make a brief remark to Angelos. Um uh, by way of like feedback. I, I think you might need to um, clarify better that uh, when Husserl is speaking about the structure of primal impression and retention and contention, that's it. It works on a transcendental register, uh, and in that respect, uh, the uh, the um, primal impression or any of the other ecstasies or uh, it cannot um, become a, 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 the dominant temporal domain. I don't think they can be modified in any way. So what is modified is the empirical. So you'll have to clarify that these are two different, these work on two different registers. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the uh, empirically, the subject uh, loses its um, insight, let's say, or its connection to the transcendental structure. And what needs to do is to become, let's say, reconnected or reawakened to uh, this structure. But the structure itself cannot be modified. Uh, and so, on that in that respect, the the past cannot become the dominant temporal domain at the transcendental level. So I think you need to clarify that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Francesca, has it? Yes. Uh, thank you. Great talks, both of you, really. Uh, but I, I have a, a humble remark for Angelo, following the critic's words. And a question for Ari. Yes, it works on the transcendental level. Perhaps the key put everything into the flesh is not the one the intentional art, the disruptions that happen into the intentional art, and that in fact the operative intentionality, which is the bodily intentionality. So if you want to fill the gap. Yeah, the transcendental explanation of the passive synthesis in us, you have to pass to Merlin. 
because he, he overcome that fear and provide you pragmatical examples to see how the child is anxious. So, uh, of course, natural space is monumental work on the question. But perhaps also having a look at middle point of view, it may help you in having this more empirical, embodied dimension of this loss of temporality. Yeah? And also to connect this with the positive intentionality, why the body becomes the convert a friend and say, she say, I don't feel my body anymore. My body is an oscillator. I, I don't know, I recognize my body. Thank you for your presentation. Thank I really enjoyed it very you. much. Evie, uh, a question. Would you mind to, would you mind saying something more on the notion of anguish, angst? Because I see this is somehow a key to connect uh, the girl meditation at least three parts and two of the self Perhaps to mention, and not in terms of a remedy, mindfulness as remedy to anguish, rather as a task to understand better the self so, so you, so you, all right. So, so where I see a rupture, you see a path. Yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I think anguish, as as Adiga put the accent on anguish in the end time and in what is metaphysics, something different. On one hand, we move into the realm of Grundstimmungen, fundamental attunement, and with what is metaphysics two years later or less, he puts the accent on the experience of nothingness. He doesn't talk anymore about the nothingness as something theoretical. He talks about the nothingness as something empirical. You can, you can do this. In very rare moments of your life, <clears throat> you can do this. And there is also traditional in the field of psychopathology, of existential psychopathology, to claim that perhaps this rare moment of the experience of nothingness may be similar to the panic attack. Maybe. Maybe. The underlying. So, to me, it seems that mindfulness can be a pathway toward this journey and not necessarily being a fracture. I, I don't know, it's just, it's just a curiosity. So, perhaps you can help me to. That, 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 that's very interesting. Uh, maybe. But the thing is that mindfulness, I suppose, well, the way I understand it, I might be wrong, has this kind of implicit, kind of underlying assumption that there is no self, that you do that, uh, you do all this practice in order to reach this realization. And I think it doesn't say that. Yes, but every experience has a minus. This is the very basic definition of the minimal self. Every experience is my experience. I, we cannot deny this. Is You're right? right. You're right. But I'm saying what the Eastern tradition would say. The Eastern tradition would say that there is no such thing as a self. And no, that's... No, and and you're right. No, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you're right. And, and, and yesterday, actually... Yeah. 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 Yes, maybe you shouldn't generalize because... Yes, because he has a back he has a background in, in Zen, I think. Um, yeah, so so this is where I see that. Yeah. So and, and I was planning to say more about self, but anyway. We have many questions, so I think right, let's okay, move okay. on. Hayden. Uh, just briefly I'll uh, I'll second uh, the point that Christos made already about about temporality. I think that's worth looking into, but but I uh, really appreciated uh, both talks. And then I wanted to note, because this came up and you were just working towards articulating this, Evie, that this critique that, that we're kind of uh, mm -hmm. touching on is kind of phenomenological critique of a really cheap idea of living in the presence. Beauvoir has that. She has it in a text called Pirates and Cineas that's really not well read. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, you know, people who say they're just going to live in the present don't actually understand time. 
now that doesn't mean that there might not be a kind of way and, and like when Heidegger talks about authentically living in the in the Augenblick in the moment, there might be a more sophisticated way to, to salvage mm -hmm. an idea of living in the present. But Bobo already uh, already hammers up his critique. It's a little bit snappy, it's really quick in that text, but it's there and it's fun and no one knows it. So check it out. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot for both talk. I really enjoy it. And I have a part I have a question for one thing enough or any so uh, in Buddhist psychology, so there are three basic kinds of emotion, the attachment, hatred, and the ignorance. I don't know if you know this uh, so not, not really. The but but three, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the three basic uh, the three basic affliction affliction that suffers. So the attachment and the hatred and the ignorance. And then in your talk, you also mentioned the hydrogen in authentic, in authentic and authentic um, and a uh, uh, sound reflective uh, life. So because ignorance is a very important part in and of course it causes a lot of our suffering, emotional suffering. So I, 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 I don't know how do you think about this connection uh, ignorance. So I don't know nothing. Hey, we, what we know is not so this reason and uh, in hide the about the uh, the inauthentic so I don't know how to do the connection between this. And uh, uh, another question for uh, Angelo. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot for the uh, for the explanation about the depressive experience I really appreciate. And I have a simple question. So how how do you think how mindfulness can actually help help the help the people to have an in, in, in intersubjective belonging because this yeah because in meditation so we are we are still with the others because in experience we experience is always uh, intersubjective. But uh, can you explain more how exactly the mindfulness bring us bring the intersubjective belonging? Yeah. Okay, so that we, we need to no, 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 no. Go, go first. Go. I don't have a lot to say. So go first. Thank you. Um, so we could first say that uh, first say that connectedness is not totally lost. So we might hear people uh, describing that they feel disconnected, but we also see them um, say that they still feel connected to other depressed individuals. So. The key, I think, is that to find ways in which we can synchronize or attune the world experience of different individuals. So we see them when it concerns other depressed individuals with whom they have a similar world experience, a similar understanding of the world, a similar attunement to the world. They can attune their experiences with each other, something which doesn't happen with the ordinary uh, individuals or non-depressed individuals. So perhaps what mindfulness could do is introduce these other ways or these lost ways of perceiving the world, these lost ways or these potential ways of, of world experience. What, how is it possible to see the world differently? By different, we could mean more similar to how other people um, see the world. In that case, if there can be attainment of those two world experiences, then there is, can be Connecting that and, and belonging as well. Uh, Hayden, someone is asking. Sorry, are you, are you, are you, I'm going to. Uh, this is I'm got, this one sentence. I'm not. I, I don't know uh, anything about uh, about psychology, but what you're saying is great because maybe that can enreach my argument, which I kind of. I yeah, which I made without actually having read. Okay, so next, uh, uh, you have a question? I uh, just want uh, to have a brief follow up on Chris's comment, mostly about the uh, transcendental level not being actually uh, corrupted in any sense. But perhaps you can actually pursue another direction by saying that, for instance, that the transcendental level of temporality can actually accommodate this empirical corruption. For instance, you can find a more nuanced description of uh, protentions or anticipations. But they could actually you know, give an explanation of why, how, and why we have this uh, perpetual sameness, 
the last objection and another observation is that we refer to at the beginning at least uh, I was here um refer to the double intentional structure the ones the temporal object the consciousness extending its own self but in particular it left out the second part uh, could you for instance say anything about uh, how depression should of the object and anticipation of oneself, follow the how the depression is cataclysmic in one sense or not in the other. First one, yeah, thank you. Uh, first on your first comment, it's definitely that it could be that the transcendental and the empirical could, in some way, be conceived of the way you describe, and perhaps when one saying that the past becomes a dominant temporal structure, that's more. Solely in a spherical um, sense, how the individual subjectively experiences um, the past, but also could perhaps be on the transcendental as well. Now, on uh, depression, the, well, we have the successive flow of consciousness and the successive flow of the temporal object. Would we see in most uh, depression studies is both phenomenological and in psychology as well, it's the subjects or individuals uh, describing their experience as the world is slow. They overestimate how much time has passed, uh, time drags, it's extremely um, slow. So in this sense, there is the, the world that goes by in its ordinary sense, but for them, the world goes by slower. Um, imagine if if the rest we were watching a movie on normal speed, but you were watching a movie on uh, half the speed. Uh, so there's a way in which you're not able to keep up with others. There's uh, a way in which the temporal object flows, but your consciousness is not uh, catching up with, with that. And this can reflect to more the individual um, spectating toward the world that they're not able to yeah, catch up they're restricted merely to observing the world. So we still have many questions. So I would ask uh, you to be, you know, I mean, if you can't answer all in yeah, detail, we, you, we can, uh, you know, speak to later. So Lisa Foran asks, uh, thank you for your talks, An Angelos and Evi. A question for Evi. What would you say the relationship between emotion, as you discussed in relation to mindfulness and emotion, mood attunement, as discussed by Heidegger in Being and Time, uh, for Angelus, what do you think the role of the lapse of time is in these accounts? The passing of time that cannot be recuperated or represented? Yeah. And there, you can see the questions here if you want. Um, the relation between emotion. Well, I'm not sure how to answer to this question. Uh, if, well, I, but maybe I did it very sloppy, but, but I try to compare to and contrast this uh, two accounts of uh, emotion, of how we um, experience um, stress, anxiety, um, in the everydayness and when kind of we awake from the everydayness. So, so what I tried to show is that in these two accounts, there are very different dis descriptions of uh, of these emotions involved in this process. Uh, but uh, if that didn't come through, maybe I did a bad job. So, uh, that's the last question. So. But the second question, what do you think the role of the lapse of time is in these accounts of passing of time that cannot be recuperated or represented? So I think the answer is very similar to what we were just, just discussing, that there is the lapse of time that goes on ordinarily, as an ordinary experience of time, but then there is the experience of time of the depressed individual, who not only experiences the world as being more slow or dragging, but also that other people uh, experience that differently. And a basic 
constitutive and fundamental aspect of our being in the world is our ability to attune our experience of the world to the experiences of other individuals. This is close to what Fuchs was trying to touch to express with his desynchronization uh, idea. Although he argues for complete desynchronization, I would not say that's the case, that's a whole other discussion. Um, so we see some kind of, to some extent, desynchronization taking place, um, which can be expressed in terms of how uh, the lapse of time is differently experienced. And this in turn alienates the individual from detunes the individual from the world. Another question to Angelos. Uh, can a comment be made on suicidality? Suicidality, which is tightly connected with depression, time, and presence? Yeah. I think not a, a direct one, but looking at the sort of consequences of not of desynchronization of or detunement from the world or being differently attuned to the world. If it's the case that the individual cannot keep up with other people's perception or experience of time, and there's no, not any sense in which this can change. So when we talk about the, the pretension aspect of the experience of depression, there is no sense in which that can change in the experience of depression. We've seen quite a few uh, first person testimonies which demonstrate that how there is no sense of which depression will ever be cured for the individual, which also connects to the individual not feeling present. So I imagine if someone is in a state in which they don't know when they will get out of, then moving to more existential level of Sartre, an, an escape or the only escape is suicide. Um, and perhaps again following Sartre, that's my, how, how might the individual establish their freedom from a world in which they are incar incarcerated, imprisoned. They might see suicide as freeing them from this prison in which they uh. Odysseus Stone says, sometimes in the mindfulness literature, an awareness of the present moment is contrasted with having a narrative sense of self. Do you think this is too crude a conceptual contrast? I was wondering about the intersubjective dimension of depression. Perhaps there is a way of being present with your friends that is compatible with experiencing yourself and her as a person's we, as a person with a narrative self. Um, no, I think that's a fantastic point. Um, so, 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 what, what, so what's the question? If this is too crude a conceptual uh, contrast. Yes, the awareness of the present, mindful uh, awareness of the present moment that says the narrative sense of self. And it's, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, this is, this is very related to what I was saying about the, the no self, right? About kind of whether, how, how does mindfulness, can we fit mindfulness in, in uh, phenomenology if there is, if we accept that the, the radical claim that there is no self, but but the but 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 this is a, this is very interesting that um, sorry <laughs> okay yeah uh, yeah um, yes I'm, I'm I'm not sure if if I full if I fully get it but I'm but I'm also a bit tired so do, do you want to, to give it a go that something yeah that we all have a narrative of our own selves our own in the world. So again, I think it, it, it all goes back to attunement, being able to attune to the world, which comes through our attunement to, to other people. So when we are with a friend, we must be able to 
to some sense attune the narrative we tell ourselves, whether it's about us as individuals or our cultural things. Okay. About some, um, I think we're running out of time. Um, there, there, Jim, okay. There is the contemplative experience of leaving your personality behind. But you don't stop existing. You, you, you're still a conscious total. Uh, and that's hard to that's what's hard to articulate what that is. I think of that as a lucidity. But but there there's there is what we could call the, the the habitual self, the ordinary self, the personality. And it, it's often a shock when you come back from contemplative experience, you've been meditating for a week, the fact that I'm not gonna be me again. That experience. There is that separation between the two, two different modes. Of existing, uh, of course, the habitual self is the narrative self. That's the story we tell about ourselves. And this other self is something much different, whatever it is. And uh, maybe that's something we could articulate amongst ourselves. Describe that better. Somehow understand that relationship instead of just this no self. And is this Husserl's transcendental subject? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if we want to go there. But, uh, it does need to come. <clears throat> and I, I'm, uh, we, I'm, I'm afraid we don't have any more time. I'm going to read out Alex's question, but we can't. you can't answer it because we have to move to the next uh, uh, panel. So the question, Alex's question is, a question for both presenters, is there perhaps in the appropriative gestel of popularized everyday takes on mindfulness, a need to be mindful of mindfulness. And would then a proper attunement to mindfulness be something like an opening onto our temporality, a focus on the present as always passing, opening onto and from a coming future through being mindful of the possibilities of the past? Okay, well, let's uh, thank uh, our speakers. Great uh, panel, thank you very much.